kid. Seriously. Hey, y'all. Welcome to the skeptical return of the Kids Seriously show. We are the only podcast that is not currently sponsored by Rocket Mortgage. And I'm not bitter about that, but if you can get a six-figure loan on your phone in 15 seconds, it's probably a terrible deal, unless they want to pay me, in which case it's a great deal. So anyways, we get together here every so often, or technically once a week, to uh, talk movie trailers that are out and play arbitrary pop culture game shows. As you may have guessed, I am not your normal host at Maya Madrid. We recently buried him on the Oregon Trail as he died of dysentery, and hopefully we can resurrect him for next week. But right now, it is me, Luke Neitzel, and I am joined by my brother from the same mother, Mark Neitzel, out there in sunny California. So... Let's jump into this. Mark, what's new with you, buddy? Well, I am knee-deep in the middle of packing because I am leaving sunny California. So my life right now is boxes and bubble tape and wrapping paper and trying to decide, do I really need this giveaway towel that I got from that one Niners game I attended three years ago? Of course you do. You never know when that'll come back and you need to prove that you're a big Niners fan because they, they win something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jimmy Garoppolo, he's going to be big someday. Oh, he's the man. Hey, so what did you do this weekend besides packing? I don't even think I talked to you this entire weekend. Um. Well, let's see. Okay, so I packed. I watched the Quakes lose 3-1. to one. Oh, man. I, I'm not trying to pile on because my team sucks too, but wow, I turned that thing on and tried to watch the first little bit of that. That was brutal. <laughs> oh, it was, it was horrible. I mean, okay, so... The giveaway for the game is the Wondolowski 143 goals pin, right? A little pin commemorating that he's on his way towards breaking the MLS scoring record, right? Yep. So on Wondolowski pin night, hey, let's start him on the bench. <laughs> yeah, especially because you have, and you have so much on the line too, where, you know, tactically or whatever, you really need to go with your best 11 rather than pumping the one positive story you have. Right. I mean, the, right. you're playing for nothing. There's three games right. left. And of course, the second he comes on the field, he energizes the team. He's got shots on goal. He scores. But, you know. Hopefully he starts the rest of the way out. And then my other worry is like, you know, he's going to set the record, I think, this year. Like, I think he's going to get another, or tie the record at least this year. Yeah. But man, you just really don't want him to set the record when they're down six to nothing. Like, you, right. hope, you hope the goal actually means something when they do it. Well, that's why we've got big hopes for uh, next week when they're playing Colorado at home, because that's a real garbage fire team that they could possibly beat and he could put two up on, and then oh, we could end the season on a high note. That is kind of a Cinderella note. They be watch. They won't start him. <laughs> they'll no. they'll rest him for the season finale or something like that. Yeah, no, that wouldn't surprise me with our front office. So. I'm trying to think. Other than that, no, we didn't do a whole lot. It's Fleet Week here in San Francisco. So, Ooh, sailors. Yeah. Town is invaded by sailors in the bridge and tunnel crowd, so it's advisable for us to just kind of stay inside and hide. Oh, what are you going to do next year when you don't have Fleet Week in Oregon? I'm going to have my windows open at 3 o'clock and not worry about the Blue Angels scaring the shit out of my cat. Oh, I suppose that could be a bonus. Yeah. What about you? What were you up to this weekend? I didn't do much this weekend. My partner's, uh, her dad had his birthday, so she went to Madison and spent the weekend with them. They went to a concert and all this other stuff. So I was home with the kids, and uh, other than going to a soccer game, I sat on the couch and watched a shit ton of sports. It's my favorite month of the year, all the Halloween stuff I always draw, drone on about, but also uh, the NHL came back this week, so... I got to watch my absolute favorite sports team, the Wild, look like shit for two games, um, and just watch multiple game upon multiple game. So it's not a weekend anyone will ever remember, but I had a good time with it, so I won't complain All too right. much. And that's what matters. Exactly. So are, are the Wild projected to even have a chance this year? or? Well, they didn't really change their roster much because they don't have a choice, and they've kind of been this middling team around, they get the last playoff spot about, and then they get eliminated in five games. Mm -hmm. But they're getting older. The guys that they were counting on to develop really aren't developing. And everyone else in the division, it's already the best division in hockey. And everyone else seems to have gotten better. So I think this is going to be a real bottom-out season. But 
they could mm. use a season or two of being the worst team in the league. I mean, they won't be that bad probably, but they'll be bad. And that's, I think the one thing that has held them back in their almost 20 years is they were kind of too good out of the gate expansion wise where they just never got to be the the worst team for a few years and stockpile real talent. So maybe now's the time to to really just bottom out and kind of rebuild this thing because it, it doesn't yeah. look pretty, and it's not fun to watch. <laughs> well, you know, and I was just thinking that you need to have a bad team to follow to be humble because of all the success your other teams have been having these last three oh. five. Yeah, it's a banner year for Minnesota sports again, too. Like, the Twins were terrible. The uh, the Timberwolves, you know, they got into the playoffs for the first time since 2004, I believe. And immediately their best current player wants to be traded away. Uh, the Wild are going to be bad. And the Vikings had a nice win today, so maybe they're rebounding, but not the start we were hoping from them. Even the Lynx, who are kind of the reliable one, had a bad year. So, yeah, uh, at least Arsenal won 5-1. to one And, you know, Manchester United has to celebrate the fact that they can beat Newcastle in the last second. So... There are some things going well for me. Uh, are you on the, the Brew Crew train? I am very much on the Brew Crew train. Very, very excited for that. That's the one team here that I've really been able to get into. So it's nice to be able to kind of like identify and have that, you know, you can share that with other people here. It's a good bonding thing. So they they just made their way to the NLDS uh, for like an hour, not even an hour ago. And they're really exciting. So that's that's been really fun. I already promised my son he could buy a Christian Yelich jersey if they made the World Series and my daughter can have a brewers build a bear if they make it so we're hoping they can they can pull off a, a win in the nlds here everyone wants to see the dodgers lose i assume yes yes <laughs> that unites everyone mm-hmm. well why don't we uh why don't we jump into this okay we are yeah. going to play everyone's favorite arbitrary pop culture game am i right am i wrong am i right Am I wrong, or am I just dreaming? You're wrong! And how this game is played is we make a series of arbitrary pop uh, pop culture questions, seven to be exact. We take turns administering the questions, and whoever administers the questions get to arbitrarily pick if your answer is right or wrong. Now, we are obviously mileless today. So I will be competing on my own versus the judgment of one Mark Neitzel who made these questions. So I'm going to do my best to try and pick the right answer as he uh, he go makes his way through the pop culture questions of the day. And uh, if I win, I earn what uh, we like to call the t- uh, 20 seconds of glory where I get to play the exciting custom bumper music that I made for myself. So hopefully I can achieve that monumental goal. So Mark, take it away. Okay. So we're doing the game a little different today uh, because I've been packing and getting ready to move. And so I didn't have a lot of time to really do much of anything. So we're going to have to uh, improvise here a little bit on my preparation. So I'm going to be giving you a series of either or questions. So it's going to be. It's like college. Hmm? It's like college. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. This is the Psych 101 of Am I Right, Am I Wrong. Oh, okay. So, I, I was going to say never the theta, but okay. Ooh, mean. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to give you two things, and you're going to have to pick one, okay? Okay. All right. So, number one, Joel Robinson or Mike Nelson? Oh, oh Joel, by far. Uh he he's funnier. He obviously created the whole thing uh, of mystery science theater, and I believe Mike Nelson is some weird Christian yell at people on the internet type guy now as well with his riff track deal and whatnot. So I, I'm I'm gonna go Joel a hundred percent. Okay, so Luke has Joel for number one. Number two, John Bon Jovi or Billy Joel. John Bon Jovi, because I think he's more self-aware of what he is at this stage and is more embracing of that, where I think Billy Joel might think he's John Lennon, and I don't dislike either of them that much, but I appreciate the fact that I think Bon Jovi kind of gets who he is and where he fits in the the spectrum. Okay, okay. So Luke has picked Bon Jovi. Number three, Kurt Cobain or Dave Grohl? 
Well, I, I don't care if anyone else thinks this is the right answer, but I believe that Kurt Cobain is a little overrated. I think um, I, I enjoy listening to Dave Grohl's music more. I think it's more repeat listening than Nirvana. I don't think Nirvana has aged well for me. And I kind of feel that Kurt Cobain grew into that cult of personality status where who he is kind of overshadowed what his art actually was and has become a bigger thing than what he actually produced. I don't re-listen to a lot of Nirvana. I don't like a lot of Nirvana when I go back to it, even though I liked it at the time, where I still do go back and listen to Foo Fighters and I do redo it. And I think Kurt Cobain's fallen into that status where nobody wants to say they don't like him because then they'll feel stupid or people will tell them that they're wrong or whatever. Like we all just have to accept that he was, you know, like the greatest musician of the last 20 years. And I just really don't think he was. Like, I, I appreciate the contributions he made. And he, he definitely should be remembered. But if you're asking me who I'd rather listen to, I'm going to take Dave Grohl every single time. I just prefer what he does more. Okay, Dave Grohl. Question number four. Montgomery Burns or Ralph Wiggum? Oh, that's a good, okay. So I'm going to go with Montgomery Burns because Montgomery Burns is a character that you can actually craft an entire story around. There's multiple arcs of who he is and what you can do with him and how he relates to the other characters, where for the most part, Ralph Wiggum's just a guy who's kind of like on the side of the screen that says something funny to cap it off. And while I greatly appreciate that, and he probably has a better collection of one-liners, like, Monty Burns is more of an actual real character that drives stories and entertains and, and does uh, does the whole thing. So I, I definitely would go Monty Burns on that one. Besides, I also yearn to um, block out the sun. Okay. Number five. Charlie Brown or the Packers' Mason Crosby? <laughs> well done. Well done. Uh, whew. Man, Mason Crosby did finally get what was that, like his fifth attempt or something? He had sixth attempt, he was able to, to knock something through. So that is good, but he's a Packer, so fuck that guy. I'll take Charlie Brown. Okay, Luke picks Charlie Brown. Number six. John, Paul, George, or Ringo? Oh, this is another unpopular answer, I feel, but it's it's the answer I really think. I'm a Paul McCartney guy. Uh, I, I know he's he's the, the one no one wants to pick. It's not trendy to say, but I enjoy his songs the most. Hey Jude is my favorite Beatles song, and I think that Band on the Run, even though I know you hate it, I th would put it up there with most Beatles songs with how much I like it. I like his voice. I like his songwriting. I I, I like him. He, did, he didn't beat his wife as far as I know. So uh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go Paul McCartney all day. Okay. Question number seven. Luke Neitzel or Mark Neitzel? I feel like that is a trick question. And uh, just to let you know, they're all trick questions. That's perfect. And as as humble a guy as I am, as, and as amazing as it is that people should talk about how humble I am because I'm so good at it, that I'm probably the least, you know, like, I'm probably the most humble person ever. You know, if there was like a a cocky league world standings, I would probably finish last. I'm probably the, the least cocky person of that. And I'm so super proud of that. Um, so I'm, I'm, but I'm still going to have to pick myself. Cause I just really, for the most part, enjoy myself a lot. Like, yay for me. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well now, so we're going to go through and we're going to tabulate your scores here, uh, going one at a time through the question. So, Question number one, who is the greatest Mystery Science Theater 3000 host between Joel Robinson or Mike Nelson? You picked Joel Robinson. So, good job. That's a point for you. You're now on the board. one nothing. Do you think there are a group of people who, who, I mean, there has to be someone, like his family, but like, there can't be a majority of people that think Mike Nelson was better, right? Uh, well, the, the one thing I, I think, and... and it makes it sometimes lean a little might for me is that I thought Joel can rely a little too heavy on prop comedy sometimes, you know, and it's just like, okay, I don't need another invention exchange, do something different, but yeah, I can see that in general. 
Uh, okay, so question number two. Who is the poor man's Bruce Springsteen, John Bon Jovi or Billy Joel? You pick John Bon Jovi, which is, of course, incorrect, because as you are right, he is far too fun and self-aware to really make fun of. Um, Billy Joel, on the other hand, is just awful. <laughs> he's awful. And he doesn't realize he's awful. His fans don't realize that he's awful or that they're awful for liking him. So, you know, unfortunately, he did not get that one. I have right. to ask a question. Is this... Is this whole question in response to the fact that I, I tweeted at you a, a video link of how the dance moves from LMAFO's uh, Party Rock syncs up perfectly with Uptown Girl? It, it might have contributed, yes. Nice. Well, I think that video justifies Billy Joel's whole, ex whole existence, personally. No. No. <laughs> okay. Question, so, so right now... One for one, you, huh? Two questions, you're, you're one for two. No okay. good. Or one and yeah, one and one. There we go. One and one. Question number three. Who had a cameo in a nineteen ninety six episode of the X Files? Kurt Cobain or Dave Grohl? And you got the correct answer, it was Dave Grohl. He played Man Walking By. Nice. Well, because we all know that, like, you know, corporate TV shows are, like, you know, ruining the world and all those things. And, like, you would have to have some sense of humor to be on the X-Files. So that mm -hmm. immediately would have ruled Kurt Cobain out. Exactly. So, all right. It's two to one. You're you're in the black. You're doing good. Nice. Okay. Nice. I got to keep this going. Need two yeah. more. Keep it momentum. Okay. Number four. Who would you rather have sex with? Montgomery Burns or Ralph Wiggum? Now, I better have gotten this right because one is a child. Well, you said Montgomery Burns, and actually um, both answers are correct because we don't kink shame here on Kids Seriously. Oh, okay. So. But but one is a minor, so <laughs> I'm not running for Supreme Court. I would rather um, I would rather stay, you know, with legal sexual encounters. They're also cartoons. Don't think too hard about it. Touche. Okay. So it's three for the good, huh. one for the bad. Come on, keep it going. I need one more. All right. Number five. Who is a better field goal kicker, Charlie Brown or the Packers, Mason Crosby? You correctly picked Charlie whoop, Brown. Whoop. Because every time he misses, it's not his fault. His holder always pulls it away from him. Okay. Well, and, and to be to be honest, as someone who lives in Wisconsin – it's never a Packer player's fault. It's always the refs or someone trying trying to screw them over because, you know, they are the righteous force in the world that everyone wants to stop, and they wouldn't actually do anything wrong on their own. It's always some type of outside force. I actually, I'm not on Facebook, but my partner is on Facebook, and I happen to see on there someone posting about how uh, the the league has ordered the refs to to make the Packers lose because the league is so against the Packers winning, and I just go, wow, that's that's the honest mentality here of normally sane people, and you people here are the fucking worst. I I would love the NFL if they had rules like that. No crap, I do love uh, piling on the Packers, especially when Maya is not here to defend himself. Yes, yes. Well, that that was also part of the fun of that question. Well, that is fun. <laughs> okay. So you've gotten four right and one wrong. You've already whoop, won. Whoop. Yeah. Now, now we're just into the gravy part of this. All right. All right. So, John Paul Georgia Ringo, who is the worst Beatle? You oh. actually did pick the correct answer. Oh, you're so wrong. Who is the worst? Okay. Now let's put aside the fact that the last twenty years he's looked like Angela Lansbury's twin sister. Every good song he has, he had John Lennon in the studio telling him, no, cut that corny shit out, tighten it up here, make it better. As soon as Lennon's dead, <clears throat> pure crap. Wings, really? Come on, band on the run? That song sucks. That song is awesome, and you that are a crazy terrible. person, and you probably picked George Harrison because that is the hipster answer, unless you're super hipster and you pick Ringo. No, it's John. He was, I mean, he's... He was a horrible person, but that wasn't what the question was. He was the best songwriter. He was the best rock star. Just better voice in general. Yeah, it's John. Okay, so you got that one right kind of by the well, back door. So you're five and one. And then the last is question number seven. Also, are you implying that Angela Lansbury isn't super hot? 
Well, you know, hey, there are, like I said, we don't kink shame here, and some people are into neck waddles. So, <laughs> you know, if that's your thing, God love you. You have a friend in the kids series. Uh, you, know, I, well, you know, I don't know if you ever sat down with our mom and watched Gaslight, which is one of her, her favorite movies. And uh, I, I remember watching that movie, and Angela Lansbury is the villain in that movie, and I want to say she was, like, 19 or 20, and she looked like she was 65. <laughs> Well, I mean, you think about it. Murder, She Wrote is, what, 40 years old? And she looked like our great-grandma back then? <laughs> yeah, she was probably 35 in it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Oh. So, question number seven. Who is mom's favorite, Luke Neitzel or Mark Neitzel? Again, you got the answer right. Grandkids. Right for the wrong reason. Grandkids. Grandkids. Yep. Yes. So. I cleaned up on that. Totaling everything up, yes. Except for missing the Billy Joel question, you went, you almost ran the table. You were six for one. Wow. Six for seven with one to the bat. So, yay, get your 20 seconds of glory. And I thank you. Here is my 20 seconds of glory. Boots and or cacao. So let's go, let's go crazy. Let's get the I guess you can dare a lick my balls, Capitan. Excellent. Well, now is time to move on, and we are going to take a question. Okay, do we have questions? I think our only question is, uh, when can you start? Right now, let's do it. And this week's question comes all the way from uh, your current home state, which is uh, California, but a little farther south down in L.A. This is from our avid listener, Clark who is a woman, and she asks, I recently heard you guys added a new member. Are you, Is he actually related to you, or is that just Maya with a cold? Wow. Okay. That's kind of brutal. Uh, thank you. I'm a little insecure about my voice to begin with, and now I'm, I'm really gonna... No, no. It is, it is new. We are... Uh... I am a new person entirely, and yes, we are related. And we it, have the same mother, the same father, and we lived together for 20-some years. Yeah, we, we are actually different people, so that is, that is glad that we could get that cleared up in one shot there. So thank you for writing in, though. So please, please ask us more questions to find out we, if we're different people. Kind of we supp- have a listener in L.A.? We do, apparently. Wait, let, let me... Let me Dial that back. We have a listener. We we do. We ha- we have a we have at least four because I'm pretty sure that I know my partner doesn't listen, but I think both of you and uh, Maya's wives listen. And um, one time we had a random guy in Kansas City who used to email us that I believe was 16, but we haven't heard from him in a while. And apparently we have another person in LA. So we are wow. just climbing the charts. And you know when I look at YouTube statistics, it tells me that we have people that listen for under uh, two seconds in Indonesia very frequently. So it's possible that they are actually computer programs, but I'm just going to go with they are people with short attention spans. So oh, that means we're international. Kid Seriously is international. So Rocket Mortgage, hit me up. I want some money. It's the biggest no-brainer in the history of mankind. Exactly. We are going to talk trailers at this point because we had two big trailers that have come out that we're going to discuss today. And Mark, I'm going to leave this up to you because I have a feeling these are both your number one and two most anticipated movies of the last 20 years. We are going to be talking the new five-minute trailer for Aquaman and the final trailer for Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald. Where do you want to start today? Oh, I'm all a tingle at the thought of both of them. Um, let's start with Thor Waterworld. All right. So before we get into the actual, you know, what you think about this movie and the content of this movie, I want to talk about the idea of a five minute trailer and how they were able to pull this off. Because I, for one, hate having too much revealed in trailers. Uh, the example I always go back to is Spider-Man Homecoming, where the entire movie is basically laid out point for point in the trailers like it's just a complete waste you know for me the point of the trailer is to show you just a little bit to get you excited so that you go in but you still have a lot of surprises 
So I'm very against the idea of a five minute trailer because I'm worried it's going to show me everything that you could possibly want to see. I have to say that I think for a five minute trailer, I still saw more than I wanted to see. But I think they did a good job of not showing us every part of the movie beat for beat. And I don't know if you agree with me on that, but I was I was going into it thinking it was just going to be a quick run through of the movie where instead it's really just a large focus on two scenes and then kind of a trailer within it. Yeah, so um, I hated it. Mm -hmm. And I hated that it was five minutes long because that stupid roof chop chase scene lasted as long it felt like as the the car chase from matrix reloaded <laughs> it just went on and on and oh my god the guy in a helmet smashes through another wall and he jumps and it, oh it just it wouldn't stop and it, you know more than anything else a trailer is supposed to grab you it's supposed to make you excited it's not supposed to make you bored three minutes into it and that's what i was so i'm putting aside the content and everything else from a, just a structural point of view it went on way too long and it was too redundant in what it presented in that chase scene. And so for me, it just, I tuned out and I, any goodwill that it had built up in the beginning and it had done some for me, uh, was just lost at the you know fifth time Amber Heard jump, jumps from one roof to the next. Sure. Sure. I, you know, I, I, I have to say, so I, I know, and I know, I wish Maya hadn't gotten dysentery and died on the Oregon Trail because I know he felt, I think, even more, more, oh, what's a good word for it? More, more vile and vitriol for this trailer than you do. I, I was actually pleasantly surprised by a lot of this. Um, first, from the standpoint that I didn't feel like I got the whole movie, which is what I, I thought we were going to be getting. I like that it was... You know, they, they show that desert scene for a very long period of time, which seems like it must be very near the beginning of the movie. And then the rooftop chase. I, you know, I'm not going to call it the greatest action sequence I've seen in a, a movie, but it didn't turn me off in the way that it did you. So I was happy from that standpoint that it, it, it didn't give us everything, because that's what I was really worried about. There is no reason to ever put out a five-minute trailer, and no one should do it. Um, two minutes is more than enough to get your point across, especially considering you're going to put out three to four trailers and TV spots and all that before a movie actually comes out. So let, let's dive into the content. Now, it's obvious you didn't like much of it. Is there anything that you pulled out of this that you liked? Well, no, actually, there was a lot of it I pulled out that I liked. I didn't like the structure of the trailer. Mm -hmm. I didn't like that they had this one long, broken, unbroken segment that was very redundant, but I thought it looked pretty. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said before, you know, for Waterworld, I worry a little that it's going to be redundant of Thor movies and, oh, this all-powerful trident that has all the powers of Atlantis. Gee, where have we seen that before? Um, but Jason Momoa, is it? Yep. Yeah, Mama. Mama. It, he was likable. Uh, I liked the kind of bro-ish approach to Aquaman, the, the, the point break-esque surfer dude mentality he appears to be bringing to the role. Um, I thought some of the visuals uh, with the underwater battle towards the end were interesting with the giant crabs and the sharks and it wasn't anything that I got up out of my seat and said, oh my God, I'm going to this opening night. But it certainly seemed better than I was expecting. Um, I was really pleasantly surprised at the end how they used his actual Aquaman suit and it didn't look completely ridiculous. I thought it looked really good, actually. Yeah, I, that was a pretty impressive. So it's not, I mean... Yeah, I'm not going to see this movie in the theaters, and I, I never was. This trailer wasn't going to do anything to change that. But overall, I thought content-wise, it, it was fine for what it presented. It was just too long. I don't know. What about you? I enjoyed this a lot more than I thought I would. Now, I have been um, – I'm a little bit more in recent years of a DC guy, which I don't know where that really came from, but – 
but I have been. So I, I feel like I've been a little bit more open-minded. And I think part of it is that for me, DC is hitting a sweet spot of I'm familiar with certain references, but I don't know the whole world like I do. I have trouble watching an X-Men movie because I point out in my head all the million things they're doing that aren't comic book accurate that don't really matter. So when I go into DC and I'm not as familiar with the lore, like most of my knowledge really comes from uh, the cartoon series, which mm -hmm. Aquaman doesn't really feature in very much. I, I get to kind of enjoy what's going on more. What I like about this trailer and what they're showing us is that it didn't ever feel like a superhero movie to me. If you didn't know Aquaman was a DC comic book superhero, I don't think anyone would look at this and say it's a comic book movie. Um, it, it had more of a fantasy vibe to it. And the one movie that I found myself kind of thinking of while watching it is that it, it had some it had more callbacks to an Indiana Jones style movie than it did um, a, a traditional superhero movie that we're used to seeing. You know, the stuff in the desert specifically right. was very Indiana Jones. And I like that idea now of taking superhero movies in, you know, different directions, like how, you know, Logan felt like a Western and Deadpool's a comedy and, you know, we haven't seen New Mutants, but they were attempting to make a horror movie. I like taking a genre that we're getting so many movies of and taking it in a different direction. So I like this one being more of a pure fantasy with a little bit of that kind of Indiana Jones adventure to it. I think Jason Momoa did pretty well. I, I like his bro shtick, but I think it's going to be a balancing act because it's it's a little goes a long way. But I felt from what we saw in the trailer, it was a decent balance of throwing it in there for some levity, but he's not going to be Paul Rudd who can't say a serious line his entire superhero movie. So I was I was pretty good with this. I liked the the visuals I thought looked really good. I like the the Black Manta look. And I also like, as you talk about the Aquaman costume, how Black Manta looks, all these things. This feels like DC's finally saying, we're just going to embrace the source material because people seem to like the source material. And we're going to make something in that theme rather than trying to think in our heads what would Christopher Nolan do and then make a shitty version of what Christopher Nolan would do, which is where I think Justice League and uh, Batman versus Superman and Man of Steel all fall short because they're, they're less concerned about making their source material than making a uh, Christopher Nolan Batman material. And I think this is the, the direction they have to go. Now, am I as excited for this as I am, you know, for Avengers four or as I was for Logan or some of these other movies? No, but I watched this trailer and I made me more likely to want to see this movie than I was before. See, my biggest concern when I was watching this is, Obvious, the, the Thor parallels are obvious, I think, throughout yeah. the whole thing. And my concern is that DC has ceded so much time to Marvel, and Marvel has done so much with comic book movies and has successfully pilfered so many of the concepts already that even if this is good, it's going to feel derivative because they're just too far behind. And... While I didn't like Superman or Batman versus Superman or Justice League, I mean, at least for the, the little bits of it I saw, and we'll get into that later, I think, uh, at least it felt like something that I wasn't seeing in Marvel movies. And I'm kind of afraid that this is going to be one where, okay, I replaced the trident with a hammer, and I wouldn't really be able to tell the difference. Yeah, and it's an interesting conversation because, like you said, it, it has more to do with Marvel having a head start on doing this and doing it right. Because they're not deviating from what Aquaman is. And my and I believe Aquaman dates back before Thor as far as a published character. So, so what do you do? Do you stick true to what Aquaman is? Or are you concerned about making something people will think is too similar to Thor? I don't know. I tend to think you just you, you entrust it with the director you like, and they certainly seem to like James Wan, and James Wan has been a very financially successful director for Warner Brothers and critically successful director for Warner Brothers. And I think you just let him do what he wants, and I think that is what happened. And if this this works, um, you know, I, I I think credit to him, and they may actually be able to launch something. the The only thing that I I think will be okay in comparisons to Thor is that. Other than Ragnarok, which is a very 
dramatic veer from what they were doing with the Thor mythology, I don't think the other Thor movies resonate with anyone. They aren't movies that are that popular people go back to. Like, he's a popular character, but it's because of Ragnarok and his stuff in the Avengers, not because of his two first two standalone movies that were oh. heavy into his mythology. Oh, no, absolutely. The first two movies are not that great. But the third one was great, and it felt like it may have kind of cornered the market on what Aquaman was going for. So if we didn't have Thor Ragnarok, then, yeah, I think Aquaman might have stood up better against Dark World or the first one. But, you know, we do have Ragnarok, and we do have them really hitting all of the right notes of you know, a god in that. And so it, it's... I'm concerned i mean i'm not really concerned and as far as your question goes what do they do i don't know i'm not smart enough to figure that out <laughs> clearly that's why I'm mom likes me better for, yeah i don't i'm not kevin page i don't work for marvel or dc so i, I don't have the answer necessarily um though so, i mean i do think that the biggest difference between marvel and dc is that and i'm certainly this isn't an original thought on my part but Marvel has always been the world outside your door, while DC has always been more of a mythology, right? The characters are archetypes, they're gods, they're yeah. the Greek mythology, basically, of the 20th and 21st century. And so finding a way to lean into that a little more, I think, would benefit them. Now, that's a very rough thing for me to say, and I don't have much of a plan beyond that. But either way, it, it turned out a lot better than I thought it would, even though the trailer was too long. Enjoyable, if that's your kind of thing. You know, plenty, plenty of movies for all of us to watch, so if you're excited about it, God bless, I probably will not see it. So bottom line, you knew an Aquaman movie had been announced, you saw this trailer. After seeing this trailer, did it make you more likely or less likely to view this movie at some point? Oh, it definitely made it more likely. Nice. Uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely more likely. I didn't see anything in there that really turned me off. Um, I was also pleased that they did take away the most valuable lesson that we all learned from Sam Raimi's original Spider-Man, which is if you cast Willem Dafoe, put him in a full-on helmet where you can't see his face. <laughs> nice, yeah. Yeah, good call there. We are going to move on now to the second trailer, which is the sequel to the first fa uh, Fantastic Beasts movie and where to find them, and that is Fantastic Beasts and the Crimes of Grindelwald, which seems to be kind of an all-out war here as we have Jude Law's Dumbledore taking on Johnny Depp's Grindelwald as they fight what seems to be an open war, World War I, World War II style time. I'm going to say right up front that neither of us have seen a Fantastic Beast movie, so we're going to be lost on some of the details of the world and the mythology here, but this uh, seems to be pretty much a war movie from start to front with Eddie Redmayne running around doing his best uh, face the entire time. Mark, what did you think of Fantastic Beasts and the Crimes of Grindelwald? You got that this was a war movie? That's what it looked like to me. Wow, okay, see, this trailer was horrible because it felt, one, like my eyeballs were constantly being assaulted by how quickly the snap cuts were, and I couldn't focus half the time on what was actually happening. It was just this blurry motion of CGI things going back and forth, and the colors were kind of muddy, and I honestly came away from this with very little idea of what I just saw. Um, I mean, I get that Johnny Depp is a bad guy, um, which, you know, good for him that he can still find work, even though he's a wife beater. Um, interesting that we also saw his uh, trailer the same day that we reviewed uh, Amber Heard's. Uh, <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Yeah. But he does I, play, he does play slimy very well. Well, yeah, I, I couldn't, tell what was going on a lot of the times i only sort of had half impressions like oh is that a dragon he's riding or oh did he throw a book at him i i was more confused than anything else and i mean i, I admit i haven't seen the first fantastic piece i haven't seen a harry potter i haven't read a harry potter book um i know nothing about it beyond the fact that on Berkeley campus on Fridays, a bunch of the freshmen play that Quidditch game. 
Oh, that's amazing. The field, yes. They run around with sticks between their legs because you can't really fly a broom, I guess. Hey, so, whatever your passion lies, chase it, man. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm not one to judge. But I, I, I know nothing about it, and this trailer did absolutely nothing to clue me in on anything that was going on beyond it's about wizards and one bad. I, I think that's funny because I take a few notes to do this, and one of the notes I wrote down was, they do not care to bring in the novice in this trailer. No. This is a trailer for people who love this world, which there are millions of people who love this yeah. world and will want to see it. There was no attempt to bring in the outside person on this. Like mm -hmm. you either know this world and this is a bunch of things that are referenced specifically for you or you don't. And I have not seen the first fantastic beasts. I've seen four Harry Potter movies but they all kind of blend together and I don't know how it all ends and, and whatnot. So I feel like I had a general, like I know who Dumbledore is and I know, you know, I know some of the basic terminology and things like that. So I, I probably had a little bit more of a basis than you to go off of, of what was happening. But yeah, it is, it is something that does not waste time to explain what's going on. And, and I give them some credit because at this stage, you know who your audience is. If you're coming into this, I mean, what is this? If you, count all the Harry Potter movies together is like the 10th movie or whatever. So if you're jumping on at number 10, it's probably your own fault anyway. But, um, I, you know, I, I was okay with this trailer, but it, it's, it felt, it felt like it wasn't designed for me. It didn't care if I, I knew anything about it. It didn't care if I wanted to see it. It was saying, Hey, hardcore fan, this is what we're doing. You're probably really excited about this. And people like you and me just get out of the way. And but, <laughs> this will be over soon. That, but even with that, it, it was the edits were so quick and the snippets were so short that I mean I don't know was I a, did you not have this problem? I found my eyes couldn't focus on what was happening and I couldn't I I could get impressions but I wasn't getting you know a lot of information because things were just happening so quickly I couldn't process it. You know, I, I don't think, no, they didn't, but that's, for me, that's, that's what I want in a trailer is I don't want, you know, like it, there, there's so little plot other than to me, it was like, they're, they're fighting a war and people have to choose sides and Johnny Depp's going to attack the non magic people. I mean, they have a line in there that's like for centuries, the magic and non magic world have been at peace and Johnny Depp doesn't want that anymore. And you have people kind of picking sides and all that. And, um, so, you know, I feel like I got a general concept of, of what's going on here and then just cl clips of action that they are hoping will entice me. So I, I'm okay with what they did because as, as I'll harp on endlessly in this show that I want vague in a trailer, I want you to not tell me that much. And I applaud them for kind of embracing that, even though they know it's going to lose people like us, but let's be honest you, no matter what they put in this trailer, you and I aren't going. Well, um, no, no, I, I get that. And I, I don't have a problem with them not making the trailer for me because I wasn't going to see this movie regardless. But what I'm saying is, is that the, the scene is cut so short, right? The, the actual time spent on any one shot is so brief that I couldn't even tell what I was looking at. Oh, okay. So I, I still, I, I feel like visually I was able to make everything out that I needed to. I mean, I'm sure there was some monsters and, or I suppose fantastic beasts that they cut through that I didn't entirely get what they were, but I, I walked away feeling like I understood enough, but this would be a very much unlike Aquaman. I saw this and went, this makes me want to see it less. Like I, I wasn't going to see it anyway, but this does nothing to peak, peak my interest. Yeah, no, I mean, this, I, I wasn't going to see this before. I was really not going to see it now. The entire trailer was just shapes and blob colors moving back and forth over the screen that I, I don't even know what I saw. And um, Eddie Redmayne's dumb face. Yes. And, and Johnny Depp's white beating face. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, great, great time to be releasing a movie with him in it. Yeah, you've, yeah, that's the best. And you know what's kind of sad about that? is if I understand this correctly, they had Colin Farrell cast in the last movie, and then at the end he, like, turns into Johnny Depp, and it's like, why wouldn't you just keep Colin Farrell? <laughs> like, he's a better actor, and he doesn't seem like as big a piece of garbage in real life. But, yeah. 
hey, that's not up to me. So uh, we examined two trailers today. Uh, we both, uh, well, while Aquaman may not be perfect, we both think it uh, it made us slightly more likely to see the movie, and it's uh, a basically a no go on Fantastic Beasts and the Crimes of Grindelwald. So why don't we take this moment now to talk about some other nerd things? I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. So I was uh, thinking about James Wan because we just watched the Aquaman trailer. He's directing it. And I don't know if you've seen any of other James Wan movies because he's primarily a horror guy. He's... I, I might have. I don't know. So, I don't keep track of these things as well as you do. I, so. I, I would guess you. He hasn't made a ton of movies. And like I said, most of them are horror. So he did the original Saw he did yep. um, the two Conjuring movies, some yep. some other horror movies, and then he did a Fast and the Furious movie. I think number seven. Which I've seen several of those. I don't know which are which and which ones I've seen, so it's possible. My understanding is that the one he did is the one that is the most well received, both critically and financially. But I could be wrong on that. But but Fast and Furious made me think about something because I have seen. 45 minutes of the first Fast and Furious movie. It is the only bit I've seen of any of them, and it is one of the very few movies where I left the theater, or technically left the drive-in in in that instance, because it was so bad I couldn't take it. And luckily it was, I was at the drive-in, so I didn't go there to see that movie. You know, you you go to the drive-in, you you pay your six bucks, and there's probably three movies you get to watch. So we went there to see something else, and then we thought we'd stay for Fast and Furious, and we ended up leaving. And I remember, I remember the impression that Paul Walker couldn't even convince me that he was an alive human being, let alone an FBI secret agent or whatever the hell he was playing in that movie. I'd like to see him try that one now. Yeah, he really can't now. What? Here, too soon? Anyways, I have only walked out of three movies in my my life. You know, I generally am like, I can suck it up and take it no matter what happens. And two of them were at the drive-in, so it was the same instance where Fast and the Furious, I was there with some buddies, and we uh, we decided we were going to stay for it. And we could not make it through it because it was so bad. I, it, it blew my mind how terrible Paul Walker was delivering lines. The other movie I also saw at the drive-in that I walked out of was Lethal Weapon 4, which is we're hitting a franchise 10 years after anyone has given a shit about this franchise. And to compensate for that, we're just going to throw in a bunch of racial Asian jokes because Jet Li is our villain because he's hot at the moment. Uh, so I walked out of that movie. And then the third movie I walked out of was uh, a little-known espionage movie starring Pierce Brosnan and Jamie Lee Curtis called The Tailor of Panama, and I actually didn't want to walk out of that. Everyone else I was with wanted to walk out of that, and um, I was forced to go because they were my ride. So um, I have walked out of three movies in my life, and it got me thinking... Mark, have you ever walked out of a movie that you paid money for? And if not, are there any movies that you you paid money for that you wish you would have walked out of after completing? Okay, so I have never walked out of a movie that I've paid for. Um, Are there ones I wish I have? Oh, God, yes. There were, when you said that we were going to talk about this, there were two that immediately came to my mind. The first one I would have walked out of, but... I was there with my wife and my in-laws and the in-laws had actually picked the movie. (laughs) I'm excited. They were also my ride. So there wasn't really anywhere for me to go. And this was Hitch starring my two favorite actors, Will Smith and Kevin James. Oh, wow. It was horrible. It was, it was not funny. It was derivative. I actually wound up taking about a half hour bathroom break in the middle of it. (laughs) And, and just hiding out in one of the stalls because I just couldn't take it. Um, but I wasn't able to actually walk out of it. I, I would have, though. The other one, which I think you could probably sympathize with, was Avatar. Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, aside from the fact that the movie is about eight hours long and... It's just a horrible endurance test for anybody to sit that long in a theater. It's so awful and so derivative and just 
a steaming pile of white savior bullshit nonsense that it was awful. In fact, the, the only reason we saw it, uh, my wife and I saw it, and the only reason we went is because every year when the Academy Award nominees are listed, we go and we see them all. Right. And that year, for some god-awful reason, Avatar was nominated, and so we put it off as long as we could, and then finally we couldn't put it off any longer. We'd seen all the other ones, and so we went to it. And we have actually instituted a rule now called the Avatar Rule, which is when the nominees come out, we are allowed to say about one of them, no, we're not going to see it. Neither of us wanted to see this movie. Both of us were miserable the entire runtime. Uh, but because at that time we had the policy and we kind of hadn't agreed to it, and there was sort of this chicken of neither one of us wanting to be the one to, to walk out on the other one with it, we sat through that whole god awful movie. That isn't yeah. That is a horrendous movie. That is the highest grossing movie of all time, and it's yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a there's an honest trailer about the the three D release of um Titanic, mm -hmm. and one of the lines they have in there is three D so real you can actually feel James Cameron stealing money out of your wallet, and oh if if that should have applied to Avatar because they you know they they put in the three D which is what's very impressive for mm -hmm. twenty minutes and then you're bored with it, and they were able to up the ticket prices five bucks minimum at least to watch a, a remake of shirt tales where they're trying to knock down the tree, but you know, with white people saving the day, as you mentioned and drag and rape to make it your own and, uh, unobtainium. I, I mean, that is a, that is vile and how, how it could be nominated for best picture just blows my mind. Like there is no standard that yeah. you can possibly put that to, where you can say that is, that is best, best picture from a storytelling perspective in any shape or form like it's mm -hmm. it's embarrassing that oh it's it, it's a low point in american culture um and james cameron i also at the same time i also have a thing where i'm going through and i'm watching every best picture winner that's ever um won ah. um which has been interesting um in a lot of ways, it's been really rewarding, uh, especially around the 70s. I've seen some great movies I might not have otherwise seen. Such but as? Also, um, Midnight Cowboy. Nice. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, French Connection. You, you know what I always think? Uh, I haven't done it on the scale you have, but a, a movie I picked out to watch just because it was a, a Best Picture nominee or a Best Picture winner that I never would have watched on my own was Kramer vs. Kramer. And I was mm -hmm. I I didn't think much going into that and was blown away how much I liked that. Yeah, that was another one that uh, I saw and, and really liked. Um, Costa Blanca. Oddly enough, that's a movie I had actively avoided for years because I really? figured it's been yeah I figured it's been so ripped off that anything good and original in it I'm going to have seen done in a dozen other movies and it's just going to feel redundant. And I watched it and I was just floored at uh, not only how great it is but how well it holds up and despite the fact that it's been ripped off a hundred times it's better than every single one that's ripped it off in every way no the performances so, alone are so good that even when you you steal what they did from a storytelling perspective mm -hmm. no one does it at the same level like uh, oh, yeah, that's one that my partner and i that's like kind of our movie that we share because uh, we don't we don't sit and watch a lot of the same movies. Like we like spy movies, but other than that, we don't share any you know common movie interests for the most part. Because she definitely doesn't want to watch horror movies, and I definitely don't want to watch Candace Cameron Bure. So we we clash a lot. But that's kind of like our movie that we can sit and watch and both just love. Yeah, and I mean the the cinematography, the pacing of the story is amazing. It, it's terrific. But anyway. So the reason I brought this up is because as a result of that, I also finally had to watch Titanic oh, for the okay. first time. And if it wasn't for this whole thing and me being committed to watching start to finish every single Best Picture winner, I would have walked out on that piece of crap too <laughs> because that was so dull and just uninteresting. He, he's, he's Stephen King, right? Like – Come yeah. up, come up, or George Lucas, come up with the concept, work on the special effects or whatever that you care about, 
let someone else write the story and the dialogue and manage the actors. And you would get so much from, from James Cameron, I really think. But he's got to do it all himself, and he is so bad at everything outside of that. And he also needs an editor who's able to stand up to him and say, no, this doesn't need the extra 45 minutes. We're cutting it out. Yeah, but that's but, never going to happen when you have the two highest grossing movies. Or Exactly. Is it one and three now, hopefully? Yeah. Oh, there's like another five of them coming. So those will probably all... Well, allegedly. I'm still... And I, you know, I wonder, the, the thing about Avatar is it's the highest grossing movie of all time, but it has no cultural stickiness. Yeah. Nobody talks about it. Nobody quotes it. Nobody rewatches it. They don't put it on cable. Like it isn't. It isn't Star Wars or any of these other things that you know. You know, like there isn't a line from Avatar I can quote and everyone knows it. Like yeah. it has no cultural impact for being the highest grossing movie, which is crazy. Which I think makes these five sequels quite the grand experiment, just to see like who gives a shit at this point. Like who's yeah. actually gonna go? Because I think. You know, there are people that that love it. My sister-in-law thinks it's the greatest movie ever made, and we won't get into that, but, you know, they'll she'll go see him, I'm sure, but, like, there's enough people like me who went and saw it because, well, this is a thing in culture that people are doing, so I'll go do it, too. Mm-hmm. Like, those people are gone. Like, you yeah. could not pay me to see an Avatar sequel. So, you know, like, what what happens with these movies? Like... They, I could see them being the biggest movies in the world, or I could see them being just colossal, colossal flops. I'm, I'm sure they'll make a ton of money overseas in China, and they'll fund them until touche. Well past our. The other movie too that I would have turned off if I could have was The English Patient. I'm Ooh. so glad I did not see that in the theater. That is a hard. That is a struggle. And and the book is terrific. I oh, is had it? To study it for a class um, as an undergraduate, and and the book has all kinds of layers and deep meanings, and it's it's really beautiful. And then that movie is just dull and ponderous, and oh, it and was I, you know, I I have a whole new appreciation for that episode of Seinfeld now after having seen it. I don't and remember that, that episode of Seinfeld. You don't remember that episode of Seinfeld? It's where no. Everybody loves the English patient and Elaine hates it. Oh, good for her. And and she can't talk about how much she hates it because everybody's so in love with it. And then finally her boss, Jay Peterman, takes her to the theater to see it. And about halfway through, she just can't take it anymore. And she just start, stands up and starts screaming, die already at the screen. <laughs> ah, that, that is good. And yeah. let's also not forget what it beat to win Best Picture. It beat Fargo. Oh. Yes. Which yes. arguably the greatest non tales from the crypt movie of the 90s (laughs) yes yes exactly so yeah the english patient is i remember watching that i watched that while i was sick in in my bed and i don't know how long that movie was but it felt about six hours long oh it's horrible and i don't think i could tell you a single thing that happened to it i know someone died in a cave that's all i got for you yeah yeah so i would have turned that one off if i didn't have to answer to myself for not <laughs> completing it. So, well, those are the those are the movies that I I would have walked out on if I could have had the the moral courage or the ability to stand up to my in laws. Nice. Well, speaking of moral courage, it's about time to have the moral courage to walk away from this episode. We are all done for the night. Mark, where can they find you online? Oh, they can find me on Twitter at Wink Martindale Five. Nice. You can find our dead friend on the Oregon Trail at Maya Madrid. You can find me at Twitter at Luke underscore Neitzel, N-E-I-T-Z-E-L. All three of us combined are at Kids Seriously. And uh, we will see you next time, I guess. Bye. Thanks for listening to Kids Seriously. If you didn't completely hate us, feel free to hit like, subscribe, or tell a friend about the show. If you want to write to us and tell us how much we suck, or just ask a question, you can reach us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. Otherwise, hit us up on Twitter at kidsseriously. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.